Welcome to Brain and Avast. We are delighted to be joined by David MacArthur, and we are going to be talking about our favorite thought experiment ever. David, would you like to start? Thank you, Mark. Yes, one of Hilary Putnam's most famous thought experiments, and he's a philosopher famous for thought experiments, is the brain in the vat. And the thought is that we could all be brains in vats. This is the experiment. We could all be brains in a vat. And therefore, if we were, and if, if our brains were being in some vat of nutrients and connected up to some supercomputer, we could be having exactly the same experiences we're having now, but the world wouldn't be the same as we think it is, right? I mean, that's the thought. And his Putnam's response to that is to deny that it leads to a skeptical conclusion. And that's the surprising thing he argued based on his views about reference. So he's of the opinion that if you, and he's talking about a case where you've always been in vatted. So you, your brain has been in this vat of nutrients from the get go. And it's even possible that there are other brains in the vat as well, but let's just stick to your one brain connected to the supercomputer. His thought is that given constraints on reference, that when that brain thinks thoughts, those thoughts are causally constrained by electrical activity in the computer. And so what it's actually thinking about and referring to by its terms is the environment it's in. So it has a causal environment, which is the supercomputer it's attached to. And so it's not massively wrong about the external world as we imagine it to be. That's the way that people imagine that thought experiment. They think, well, we could be having all the same experiences and the world be radically different. But Putnam's thought is, well, hang on. If the brain has been in that vat connected to the computer all that time, then its causal environment is just a different causal environment. It's got a different world and it's not wrong about its world. It's right about its world. Its world, of course, is quite different to ours, but it's not as if it's massively wrong about the world we imagine we're in. So he tried to undermine the use of that thought experiment for skeptical purposes. And it's controversial, of course, but I think he produced a very compelling case. And I think it's one that's taken up by other philosophers as well. I think Donald Davidson also agrees with Putnam's line on that. Now it's interesting because Putnam, when he said this stuff in Reason, Truth and History, he wasn't really trying to refute skepticism because if you think he's doing that, you can easily adjust the case and make it a skeptical one again. So for instance, you could say, well, Hillary, how do you know that my brain wasn't taken out of my head last night by intelligent aliens put in a vat connected to a supercomputer last night? So I'm having all the same experiences. So it matters whether you're talking about a recent invatment or uh, you've been invaded from the beginning. So the, the problem of recent invatment is still there. And it, it's not as if he's shown that couldn't happen. But what he did say was still surprising to people because they hadn't really thought a lot about how a skeptic or somebody thinking skeptically would would be able to refer to things in the world. In other words, like Descartes thinks, oh, maybe I'm just a mind and I never had a body and there never was a world like I imagine it to be. And I was always dreaming or always hallucinating or an evil demon was making me have the experiences I take myself to have. So in that case, you have what Putnam would call a magical theory of reference. That's to say, you take yourself to be referring to something that never existed. And in that case, he's thinking, well, how did that happen? Reference depends on information bearing causal interactions with objects. So if you didn't ever have those, then how is it that you take yourself to be using your terms to refer to something that ever actually existed? So he's using it to show that if you were skeptical in the way Descartes is, then there's semantic problems with how your thought could be of or about what you took it to be about. So it's as if he's using a sort of sophisticated views about semantics and reference to undermine a fairly standard Cartesian skepticism. Now he does it 
in virtue of the brain, the VAT scenario. But he's trying to show that the standard ways of thinking about skepticism where people think, oh, it's perfectly intelligible to suppose I never was in touch with the world external to my mind. He wants to show that's an illusion, but it doesn't remove all skeptical worries or all skeptical concerns and not all versions of the brain and the vat get eliminated or undermined. Only that particular one that captures the kind of Cartesian thinking does. So that's the way that ran. So I take it that for Putnam, the real contribution isn't so much as a dismissal of skepticism, but it's to, to rethink the way our thoughts work. So our thoughts right. for him have external content. They reach out to things in the world rather than internal content, which is just sort of mulling around in our heads and is right. causally separate from what goes on outside. So he's saying that our thoughts refer to things in the world in virtue of them being caused by things in the world. And before Putnam, there was a greater alliance on something called the descriptive theory of reference, which says that we have these descriptions in our heads that are matched with words. And those descriptions magically reach out to objects in the right. world without there being necessarily a causal connection. But that magical connection right. is just that it's magical. We don't understand how right. it works. Causation is much easier to understand. So then my question is, why does Putnam think that the causal theory of reference is better? I mean, on the face of it, there is one reason, which is that the descriptive theory seems magical. Like it's just unclear how you would reach out, but does it have any other independent reasons for thinking this? Well, one of the things that he came to see, and I guess this bears on his thinking about realism and idealism, anti-realism, he came to see that reference and his general realist position in philosophy, that there's a world that we're in touch with, as you said, that our thoughts refer to, depends on perception. Perception is a fundamental basis for this. And this is something that he hadn't put a lot of emphasis on when he developed his internal realism in the 70s and 80s. And then from about 1990, he started focusing more on perception and realizing that a lot of his thinking prior to this 1990, which is a sort of watershed year for him, hadn't taken enough account of perception. So if you do think that perception plays a fundamental role in connecting us to the world, it's a natural thought to think, well, perception is is a causal notion. It's not reducible just to causation, but it involves causal interaction. I mean, our general understanding of perception is that there's information carrying modalities, light and sound and some particles for the sm smell and taste. And that this is what our interaction via this causal medium gives us connection to the world. And so I think he, it's that perceptual basis that gives a, another layer to what he's saying in the brain, the vat story. And he came to focus more and more on the importance of perception. And in that way, he picked up William James's direct realism uh, in the pragmatist tradition and also the direct realism of thinkers like J.L. Austin. Uh, and so Putnam became what's called a direct realist. Again, there's all these real terms, realism. You've got to keep track of them all. This is direct realism in the philosophy of perception, where the thought is that in seeing a table, you see the table rather than seeing some impression of a table, which then you ask the question, what causes that impression or what causes the sense data of the table? Putnam would reject that, reject talk of sense data and impressions and say, no, I just see the table. I don't see something in between. Whereas he used to think <laughs> that you saw something like sense data and then that there was a causal story beyond that. And once you think that way, of course, skepticism arises very quickly because you can then say, well, why couldn't there be different causes? <laughs> and then the dream or brain, the battle, whatever it is, could just different causal stories for how you got those sense data. And then it seems to be unanswerable at wh why you would choose one cause over another. So he saw, I think, this direct realism as a way of blocking a move towards skepticism through a representational theory of perception. And that does sort of flesh out the sort of an anti-skeptical move. And again, none of these things on their own eliminate skepticism. Skepticism has a way of rearing its ugly head in many different forms. 
but it is part of his arsenal against the skeptic. And it does flesh out the talk of some kind of information bearing causal constraints on reference to say, well, actually in most cases, that's a perceptual connection, or at least in fundamental cases, of course, in science, you have experiments and you have more indirect causation, things that aren't observable, but still playing some causal role, which you is mediated through your understanding in theory. But in any case, perception is still fundamental, even in those cases, right? Because you're looking at the instruments or the, you're doing experiments with things that are observable and you're talking to other scientists who are observable. <laughs> so. <laughs> That would be the first sort of answer I'd give to that. So we had David Chalmers on the show to talk about his latest book, Virtual Reality Plus. And so he likes this idea that if you are in a virtual reality world that is just composed of bits and bytes, that it is real, that it's just a different causal mechanism to how our world operates. And right. that you needn't fear living in a world like that. We might very well live in a world like that. He thinks that the probabilities, I think he puts it at about 25% that we are in a virtual <laughs> world as it is, but he says, don't worry, it's real. Now, the case that you hint at earlier is where you have a shift in the world. So you become inverted or you take a hallucinogenic substance and it right. changes your perception of reality. And it might be that you're unaware of this. You can imagine that someone has planted the substance in your food or that you got kidnapped in the middle of the night and became the brain of that. How do we explain what's going on here? Because it seems like there's going to be a misperception that goes on. You've moved from a world of, let's say, hard reality to a digital world or to a drug enhanced world. How does Putnam make sense of it? Right. That's very good. Well, one key question is whether you're aware of the change. I mean, because this, so this points out the difference between philosophical skepticism and what you might call ordinary or everyday skepticism. <laughs> nothing rules out everyday skepticism, like nothing in philosophy rules out that you could be massively wrong about the world, systematically wrong. So this is the case, I think, in the matrix. In the matrix, that's not philosophical skepticism because for a start, you can take this pill, right? That, and you know that it's disrupting your access to the world. So there's a thing you can take that sort of changes the, the way that this simulacra works. And you know that. And so you can discover that and play with that fact. But also remember that in the matrix, Neo sees a black cat, I think twice, a, a glitch, and it's like a deja vu. And then the people in the, a t tell him a deja vu shows a glitch in the matrix. And then you're aware that something's wrong, that it's not how things should be. So that's not philosoph philosophical skepticism is where everything's the same and you can't tell there's absolutely nothing you can go on to show that you're in a simulation or just a, some way of presenting reality that isn't real some fake world so the case you're talking about where you take something and it distorts your perception of reality massively let's say well, you're going on a ride and now you're, yes, it's massively distorted. Maybe you're now going to make lots of false judgments about the world. You're going to be misperceiving, maybe living in an illusion to a large extent. But I think Putnam's thought is that it still won't be skepticism of the sort that philosophers care about, which is that there will be a way back either through overcoming the drug or through a kind of investigation of your world from the limited position you're in, <laughs> because there will still be some way, like you'll still have the black cat or there'll still be something, the pill, there's still some way you have of getting access to the world. And there's some things you could rely on, even if maybe they're quite limited. So it would be that <laughs> thought that there's a difference between systematic mis error and just the thought of completely global illusion where there's an absolutely no way out. Now, an interesting thing that crops up in light of your question, and this is something Putnam doesn't talk about, but it is a natural thing that follows on from his thinking, which is that, that when you think about the brain of that, as it's imagined by philosophers, there's something magical about it because the supercomputer never fails. Like it, it never has a power outage. 
it never has a computer error or a glitch in it. It's imagined to be perfect. And it's interesting because that was meant to be the sort of updated technological replacement for the evil demon. But there's a way in which it's really the evil demon in computer clothing. It's the same thing because it's imagined to work perfectly. And since everything we know, all the technology we know, it, it never does, right? We all know that computers fail, that you do have power outages or something goes wrong, right? It's very familiar. Things overheat, things burn out. That doesn't happen with the computer in the imagined brain, the bat scenario. And in that way, there's something kind of otherworldly unreal about the thought experiment. And so it's in that sense, it's cooked. It's kind of, it's prejudiced. And it's also based on uh, some notion of God or something God-like. And in that way, it's not as up to date or as empirically possible as you might have thought. So two objections. The one is just on behalf of the, the idea that we are living in a simulation. I challenge you to have a look at YouTube and have a look at all these videos of people who claim that they've witnessed glitches in the matrix. So they, they're going about their day and then weird stuff happens. Now, of course it all could be nonsense, but there right. are a lot of people who do seem to experience the world in a way that they feel is glitchy. Right. And we can of course explain that away in other ways. We can say, well, right. the problem with the camera, the footage is cooked. There's a problem with their brains in that moment. Or right. the other way of looking at it is that there's some sort of glitch in, in our reality. And right by a computer. And then right. the other objection is more technical against the direct realist approach. So direct realism says that we experience the world directly. We don't experience it through some medium like sense data or sense impressions. We experience the world directly and the world causes our experience. And in virtue of that causation, our beliefs and our thoughts can refer to the world. Now, Let's think about that for a moment. So I have a thought about a table and that thought gets caused by the table in my room, but I don't see the full table. I don't perceive the full table. I never see the full 360 degree view of the table. I never perceive the full object. I perceive a version of the table. I perceive it from an angle. I see maybe three legs of the table, but I won't see the fourth, but I still say, the word table and it refers to that object. It seems that if our, our thoughts and our beliefs and our terms refer to objects in the world and that reference is caused by the object, but specifically caused by our perception of the object, that our perception is incomplete, then mm. there's a problem because it's in my head, the table has four legs, but I'm only perceiving three. And when I say the word table, I'm referring to a or legged object. So there seems to be some sort of extra story that needs to be told there. Good. So getting back to the first part of the question you raised about glitches, I don't think there's any philosophical argument that could convince anyone who's in any state of mind that argue them from premises that are undeniable to a conclusion that there's an external world, world external to their minds or whatever. So I think that if some people have a sense that the world that they're experiencing now is unreal, I don't think philosophy is going to be able to argue you are out of those experiences. I mean, I'm sure that's true. So you're absolutely right that I think there are certain ways of experiencing the world, which are alienating and maybe disturbing and part of some psychiatric condition. But philosophically, I think Putnam also thought that just if it isn't a matter of philosophy, if it is a matter of reason and argument, then one of the things I think he would have wanted to stress more and more as time went on would be that he was very opposed to solipsistic thinking. And that's to say, I think he's always wanting to say that language and thought depends on, and this gets to the book dialogue that you're engaged with other people like part of the crucial part of the world isn't just that there's tables and chairs it's that there's other people who you're engaged with and i think it's a fundamental thought he has is that there's others and we interact with them and that they're real and i guess that may be something that psychotic or the people that you said maybe thought the world is glitchy 
I mean, I used to be a doctor, medical doctor, and I met schizophrenics. And that's one of the things that seemed to be true of them, that a lot of them had the sense of other people are not as real or as artificial or part of some giant conspiracy, but maybe not what they seem to be. And that thought that they might all be robots or something like that would have occurred to some of them. They're often highly intelligent. That's another interesting thing I noticed. But I think Putnam himself, it was very important to him to think that the others who you engage with and who you, your friends or lovers or family or whatever, that there are real people and you see and engage with them. And I think, um, I think he thought that was sort of sanity <laughs> to think that. And I think any view that suggested that, like, for instance, his teachers in logical positivist teachers like Carnap and Reichenbach and so forth, they believed in a thing called methodological solipsism, where a feature of your thinking is that you can imagine that you're, for methodological purposes, that you're the, the only mind there is, and then you construct meanings from an individualistic position. Well, I think he had a sort of a moral objection to that, which was, I don't want to start in philosophy in any position in which I deny my connection to others. So that would be part of my response to your first bit about glitches. But as for the second bit, what you're saying there is right. And it was used by Bertrand Russell in his, the problems of philosophy to, to suggest this representational position where you talk about sense. I'm immediately aware of sense data and then the world beyond that. And the world beyond that, it goes beyond any partial view I have of it. But it's also true that if you think about the world as in three dimensions and you seeing a three dimensional object, then it's just a fact of geometry that you won't see the, if it's not transparent, you won't see the back of it. If you're looking at a tree, you won't see the back side of the tree. That doesn't show that you, that you don't perceive the world. It's just a fact that to perceive a three dimensional opaque object, it'll always be the case that there's a front side and a back side. And as you walk around the tree, you'll see that other side and you, and then you won't see the side you saw before, but that's just, those are facts that you can even photograph them. Like they're objective. They're not, doesn't show that everything is subjective. It's just the nature of perception that it's going to follow certain geometrical rules about how light falls on things and bounces off it. And it's true that not everything in the world, all sides of things are seen all at once. That's absolutely true. But again, it doesn't really show that, that you're locked inside your own experience or something like that. It just shows that's the nature of perceiving that, that it is in the way you mentioned partial, but you get around that by movement, by action. You, the fact that you can walk around and see those other parts or see the legs is a normal thing. So there's a tight connection between perception and action and seeing the world isn't just from one location or a fixed perspective. You constantly roaming about and, and then you do see all of the legs. There's no problem. So if the thought was it has an implication of skepticism, I don't think it has that implication. It, it's sort of more about the nature of what perceiving is. And yes, it is kind of, it's partial. It's, it, you don't see everything and you don't see the insides of things either. Wittgenstein wonders somewhere, how do you know that other people have brains? You never see them. <laughs> I mean, maybe the conclusion that the objections try, trying to reach isn't skepticism or solipsism, but right. more the idea that there might be sense data. So I'll give you an example of an object that we perceive from one position and are unable to perceive from other positions, and that would be the moon. My understanding is recently an image was taken from the far side of the moon, but that was very recent. So for right. millennia, humans only had access to this single face of the moon that always faces the earth. It never shifts. It's locked to our earth. And the question is, well, when we use the word moon, are we referring right. to the whole thing? Or are right. we only referring to the bit that we see? Now, I think that intuitively we are referring to the whole thing. Yeah. The question is, does the direct realist approach actually explain why? Yes, you can say, well, it's baked into a theory about the way that physics works and that yeah. light only reflects off the surface yeah. that is reflected back at us. And so we would only see that. But that doesn't explain why 
we refer when we use the word moon to the whole object. That just explains why we could refer to some of it. But we do refer to the whole thing, which suggests that there must be some kind of intermediary between the moon and us, which is playing a role that has greater content than just the direct perception. It would be some conceptual stuff thrown in there like it has a back. Well, instead of saying that, you can still say what I said before, but you can say, as you said at one point, uh, you do see the front face of the moon, and that's a thing in the external world, not in your own mind, or not purely in the mind, right? But you go beyond it in thinking that it's a round spherical object. And if the same side of the moon is always facing you, then you have a kind of poverty of evidence for the other side. And it could be that it's like an apple where someone's taken a giant bite out of it. So that the moon could have been, it's like round on this side, but then there's a giant scoop on the other side. And we'd be wrong in thinking it was like a tennis ball. And I guess you're right that the reason people thought it was, or and, and now they have direct it evidence that it's like that, but you know, from telescopes and all, all sorts of things, but maybe there was a time when you could have been wrong about it, but you'd look at the moons of other planets and you'd see they're fully round. And maybe you just, you are making an inference that goes beyond the evidence. But I think Putnam would say, this is a case of fallibilism, any sort of scientific inference, and this could count as such, it goes beyond the evidence and it could be wrong. And there's other ways in which you could account for the data and different to what you imagine uh, that's okay there's nothing wrong with that again it doesn't show that what you're aware of is just something inside your own mind and not in the world but you're right that it shows that we might be wrong about the world and that as you said that we rely on analogy theory all sorts of things to try to get us beyond what we do see and to posit how things are and it could very well be that and we know that it's true that some, a lot of the things we have posited like that have turned out to be wrong or ne in need of adjustment or filling in or something like that. So absolutely. So that Putnam, as he got older, in a sense, he became more and more pragmatist in spirit. And he, at the end of the day, he really fully embraced the pragmatist theory of inquiry, the pragmatist epistemology which is a fallibilist epistemology. And he would be very happy with the thought that, well, science isn't aiming at certain knowledge it's giving you at best fallible knowledge or even you might even say it's giving you reasonable belief that's fallible that's revisable and your example is a good one like that but of course now i take it you're you wouldn't deny that, that there's all sorts of instances that the moon is round and we do we have seen the other side and all the rest of it <laughs> so one of the things you said earlier is that Quine kind of laughed off the brain of that experiment. Within the last couple of weeks, we've had a group of scientists put a bunch of brain cells in a vat and get that <laughs> brain to play the game Pong, the 70s game. Right. And so there's something kind of amazing about this idea. Yeah, of right. course, it's the, the most obvious inference is that our simulators are giving us a signal. They're saying, hey, guys, you're all brains in a vat. We thought we'd just give you a little heads up so you can work it out from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I wondered about this, which is if we're going to have a theory that's meant to capture reality there's things in the external world and there's things that are internal to our minds so we want a theory that can explain how there could be objects in the world before you had intelligent minds so the idea that before there was a being that could perceive volcanoes or dinosaurs that those things existed we also want a theory that can take into account that we can have strange thoughts that could never be reflected in reality which could come in a variety of ways so the one might be you can conceive of a unicorn, even though unicorns don't exist. Although we might think they exist within a fictional realm, like Harry Potter exists. The other one might be, we think of impossible objects, like a ball that is white all over and black all over, that could never exist. And I wonder if direct realism can make sense of all of these different things. I don't think it can make sense of impossible objects, because, I mean... Uh, direct realism in philosophy of perception, it requires the idea that these things are possible things and indeed actual things <laughs> because you're in interacting with the actual world. And if it's merely possible, I guess you're not perceiving it. You can imagine perceiving it perhaps, 
just like we can imagine perceiving the other side of something like the other side of the tree. And then we don't actually go around and have a look, but impossible, impossible objects. No, I mean, direct realism shouldn't be a view that constrains what the world contains because not everything is perceptible, right? So, I mean, he's a big defender of scientific realism, which is the positing of unobservables to explain observable phenomena. A lot of those unobservables aren't, well, they're unobservable. They're not observable. There's, we don't have a way of seeing them unless you want to say, and to some extent you can say up to a point, again, I think it trails off that, that these posited things, are maybe can be seen through a microscope. And then you, do you want to say that you see them if you're talking about on microscope or if you're talking about some other kind of technology that's very different and that, that, that generates images through some computing process and then to say, well, I see the end result of that, but do I see, does that mean I see via that process the the thing that's been like, for instance, astronomy now where it's, they get data in and then they construct maps of the universe. Does that mean because you see the picture, you're see that is seeing the phenomena. It's a very indirect causal path. And I don't know, think that people would call that seeing it, but again, I think our intuitions are odd about things like that because the notion of seeing is very, as Putnam liked to say, a lot of these notions are extendable. You can extend the notion of seeing. And I think we, as we develop technologies, we did extend what we counted as seeing. So where does it s stop? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> it does seem to me to be a problem that if there are certain things that you could not perceive in real time, but then right. you could have a time distortion that you'd be able to perceive it. So if we think about right. most photos we've seen of the Northern Lights, what you have are lots of dancing green sort of images all over the show. Right. Those images tend to not really exist. What they are is that they're a photograph that's taken with a time delay. So it creates the impression of the shimmering of lots of light. Similar things with right. the sky full of lightning. I imagine that as you hinted at earlier with, with astronomy, that a lot of the images captured by James Webb are really capturing objects that exist at many different times or from a very long time ago. They're not things that are perceivable now. It seems right. that we want to enlarge our scope of what counts as perceiving to include all of that stuff. But there is also a sense in which there is a misperception because if you went up to Iceland and you said, I'm going to go watch the Northern Lights, you'd see something very different from your friend's photograph of the Northern Lights. And it seems like we want to be able to explain those two things. Yeah. As you're saying, I think that obviously perception is some sort of evidence of something <laughs> with it, when it comes to lights in the sky, the explanation of that is going to be complicated, right? Because light gets bent and also it goes through various media and changing its color. So the explanation of that phenomenon is not going to be, it may not be something that for common sense, right? It might require scientific theory. As you say, also seeing like the night sky stars is an interesting example because we're inclined to have our view of perception and the standard of perception based on the things that are near, near to us, trees and tables, chairs, and cars and houses, you see a star and you're seeing something that as we now know is it existed because of the speed of light and because it takes many years for the light to travel to us from could be something that you're seeing something that existed thousands of years ago. And also it doesn't have the feature I said before that you can't walk around the star. It's so far away that any movement here doesn't really affect the way it looks. So it's like it needs correction by scientific understanding. That's a case where it'd be easy to go wrong and think that when you see the stars, you're seeing something contemporaneous. That's a natural thought. And if you have that thought, you'd be, you'd actually turned out to be wrong. So that's a feature of perception which leads you into error and where it needs to be corrected by science. So again, nothing that Putnam says about direct realism uh, shows that it doesn't lead to illusion or doesn't play into some 
error like that, a natural error, and which would have to be corrected by scientific thinking. He's very happy with the thought that correction is necessary, and that's one of the things science does do. So sort of get back to your perspective, and I think it's right, is that perception is partial, and being partial, it can go wrong. You can think that you understand something through perception and you don't. I think where he wants to place most emphasis is on the near and the close, that not necessarily seeing stars. But it is interesting because seeing stars is what got philosophers going, right? The whole idea of the earth at the center of everything, the stars revolving around us. People have been thinking about the stars for thousands of years and having views about it. So it is interesting that it creates troubles for us. If we, if you put push direct realism about the stars in a certain direction, you will go wrong. And then it would, you might say that shows that nothing that Putnam says about that shows that we can't be quite in error based on perception. I mean, obviously we can. But I think he cares more about the fact that it's the fact that the mind and the environment are interacting in some way, rather than getting over the Cartesianism that says the mind has its own contents completely autonomously, and then that there's some causal story in addition, like as if you could break perception into these two parts, an inner part and an outer part. I think that's what he wants to reject that. Now, you can reject that in all these cases we're talking about, even if they do lead to a natural illusion, it's still you are seeing something external to you. It's just that you mistake it for something you might say closer and more contemporaneous than it really is. And that it's just that the vast reaches of space are so vast that the sort of scale boggles the mind. And I was just looking with my child son at one of these YouTubes on, it was like size comparison of mass. And it goes right down to the smallest graviton and then right up to the weight they've actually nasa's measured the weight of the universe <laughs> and it's just the scales are so as unbelievable like going down so with so many zeros before the tiny little number and then when it comes to the weight of the universe it's such an enormous weight and we're in right in the middle of all that and it's something that ordinary perception just can't deal with those scale differences it's just it and it's why we have such trouble understanding contemporary physics, right? Where you're dealing with things that are very small, very fast. They just don't fit with ordinary ways of understanding the world through perception. So I think you're right that perception is very limited regard, even if it's philosophically important that we're, that the mind is interacting with a real world, it's still an extremely limited access to that world, which needs to be really fleshed out by theory and by experiment and by collaborative endeavor. I want to return to a different part of Mark's objection, which is about fictional or imaginary characters. Yeah. So if the content of our thoughts is external, so it reaches out to the world and it's caused by the objects in the world, how do we make sense of the notion of Santa Claus or the King of France? There is no King of France. Uh, so it seems like when I talk about the King of France, I'm not talking gobbledygook. It's not baby right. language. It's not nonsense. There does seem to, you can understand what I'm saying. We can form sentences right. about the King of France. We can say the King of France doesn't exist. There's no King of France. And you know what I mean when I say that, or Santa right. Claus isn't real. And yet I have a picture of Santa Claus in my head, or I have concepts around Santa Claus, beliefs about Santa Claus, which may be false or true. If our thoughts, the content of our thoughts is caused purely by the external world, then how does that work? Well, <laughs> I imagine that in cases of fictions, I guess Putnam would say we're using conceptual resources drawn from the actual world that we know, and we're redeploying them to understand the fiction. So we're still deploying concepts like France and like King that we can deploy in the actual world, but now we can deploy them for things that don't exist, fictional things like a unicorn. We know what a horn is. We know what a horse is. So we can construct the idea of a unicorn from those concepts and then talk about things that don't exist. So I think logically speaking, Putnam would agree with if there's some kind of problem of language where you say the 
present King of France is bald, the famous Russell example. Putnam would agree with the sort of the broad move of analysis, which would be to say, well, you don't have to think of it that way. You can think of it in a different logical form in which you're not referring to a non-existent thing. Uh, so in Russell's example, he turned that name into a predicate. So something is the King of France and then said that's false. So is the King of France, yes, now it's become a predicative expression and it's just constructed out of various concepts that we do have understanding of. So I think some sort of constructivist story about how we put together the bits and pieces of these fictions out of concepts that we do deploy, do understand and have a grip on in actual judgments about the actual world is probably how we do it. But, but it's not to say there aren't puzzles about that because we also talk about, we think about that world as having things that are true in that world, true in the fiction. And so we, our thinking about the fiction is obviously a lot broader than just talking about the redeployment of concepts because we have a way of treating it as an almost another world. I think when you read a novel, it's like you're participating in or somehow looking into or imagining another world and you can say all sorts of things about it. And so there is this interesting sort of analogy with the logic of ordinary judgment in the fiction, as it were. <laughs> So I guess deploying all sorts of semantic and psychological understandings in this fiction. And it just seems like a thing we can do. Imagination has that power. And uh, I think Putnam is a philosopher who, I mean, a very imaginative philosopher himself. I think he would be very happy to push some of that, <laughs> the issues into the realm of, well, that's the work of imagination. And we, Philosophers don't really have a good story to tell about how the imagination works. I think philosophers are at a bit of a loss and except to say there's going to be some analogy with facts. I think that's all they're going to say. So the book that you've worked on with Mario de Caro is on Putnam's work, but through dialogue. And so you have Putnam engaging with his critics in a huge variety of areas. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the thinkers that influenced Putnam and who Putnam has influenced afterwards. Well, like I said before, I think the main influence on him is coming from logical positivism and then Quine. I think that's a huge, that's, his thinking is in terms of a response to that. And in responding to that, he's also responding to the origins of analytic philosophy, which gave rise to logical positivism. So there's Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein. And then it's Carnap and Reichenbach. It, Reichenbach was his supervisor and also the supervisor of Ruth Anna Putnam. And she's another big influence on him because she's the pragmatist in his life, the Dewey and the Jamesian who got in his ear. And over time, she turned the Titanic around and got him thinking more about pragmatism. And he really did adopt a lot of pragmatic thinking towards the end of his life, even though he was leery of saying he's a pragmatist. So James and Dewey are huge influences on him, I guess, Peirce to a lesser extent. Now, another one is massive is Richard Rorty, who in a sense, Rorty was one of those people that brought pragmatism back it, from a sort of a state of, I don't know, decline it, it, after Dewey's prominence in American philosophy, pragmatism seemed to fall in interest or it was followed in a few places, but in mainstream philosophy, it wasn't talked about as much. And Rorty really helped to bring it back into play. And Putnam and Rorty had a very interesting relationship, which is that they were both pragmatists, both neo-pragmatists, as we say, and yet Putnam found Rorty enormously interesting and provocative, but also Put Rorty was that guy that Putnam, like a big brother, younger brother, he had to punch him up. He had to engage with Rorty in a way that was always opposed. It's like there was an agonism between him and Rorty. And I found that perplexing as a student because when I read Rorty and read him, I found it extremely difficult to separate them. <laughs> I mean, I, I found that on almost every issue, they were really close and found that Putnam's version of Rorty wasn't 
quite accurate. I think that was one thing about Hillary that he what about Rorty, he seemed to engage in a kind of a ca bit caricaturing, I think would be fair. I think he wasn't entirely fair to Rorty. <laughs> And I don't quite understand why, but that's what it, Rudy was the fall guy, <laughs> it, the Laurel and Hardy. He was like sort of the guy that was always um, falling over, at least from Putnam's perspective. So Rudy had a very interesting dialectical relation to Hillary, which maybe could come out in the book a bit more than it does. We actually would have liked more Rudy, but it wasn't possible to find it because most of this Putnam didn't write up. He did it in conversation and in class. I mean, he has some articles on Rorty, but, but you know, this, the way he engaged with Rorty was something quite unique and special. And it's still something that's very interesting to me today to think about. But I think Stanley Cavell also is another thinker in Harvard philosophy department who had a big influence on Hillary. And that's to say the relationship of Hillary to Wittgenstein is another vexed and interesting relationship because Hillary... Uh, as influenced as he was, he always used to say, I'm not a Wittgensteinian. And it was important for him to say that because at Harvard, there were a lot of people who probably could have counted as Wittgensteinians and it was important for him not to be that. Another thinker that I think had a big influence on him was Bert Drebin. Bert Drebin was a famous philosopher at Harvard for many years and had a huge impact on Quine and on Rawls. And who didn't write much philosophy himself, but was a very dialectical, conversational philosopher, a person who had incredible knowledge of the history of philosophy and was a wonderful conversational partner for people and somebody that Putnam and many other philosophers at Harvard sent their work to get it reviewed because he was an amazing philosopher. And I think Hillary valued his interactions with Drebin. And they were also antagonistic. If you piece in the book, which records this is wonderful because you can see Hillary loves Bert and he thinks about him still really warmly. And he says he wants to keep imagining him and having the conversation. So he says he imagines Bert saying something. He thinks of a response to it. And then he says he imagines what Bert would say to that. And he keeps the conversation alive in that way. So, um, I also think certain female philosophers had a big influence on Hillary. And again, we put as many of those in the book as we could, but I think the influence of them was greater than maybe even the extent to which it seems to be present in the written work. Again, it was something he mentioned a lot in conversation. So Martha Nussbaum's work, Cora Diamond was extremely important to him his later work. And I think Iris Murdoch is another one who he constantly referred to her work and was really cared about it, especially at the fact of her work in moral philosophy. But a mission that Hillary had was to overcome the fact value distinction or dualism. And I think he saw Iris Murdoch as a great forerunner uh, of that. And so he used to give her credit for that. And he, it was one of his big missions in his later work is to criticize that view and to criticize the view of science as value neutral inquiry that maybe Max Weber seemed to forest on the world. And I think Putnam thought that was deeply wrong and thought values are all through science and scientific inquiry. So there's some of the influences, but I think the story of the book is that he's influenced by almost everyone he responds to quite remarkable and to work with him was very interesting because i was working on skepticism and as i did and he had another student who was working on skepticism as we worked on it he started to think more and more about skepticism and then he started to write about skepticism <laughs> not exactly what we wrote but it was definitely influenced by us but you couldn't say the influence was any particular thought we had it was more like it was more like an atmosphere <laughs> and certainly he saw things in a perspective that was sympathetic to the one we did but when he came up with stuff it was always with the hillary putnam charge and spin and color it had his stamp on it <laughs> so 
that was kind of interesting to work with him that way because you could see that you had an influence on him, which was quite of remarkable that I, I'm amazed that happened. But yet it wasn't anything direct and you couldn't say, well, you should have foot footnoted me when you said that. <laughs> it wasn't like that. But he was this guy that loved doing philosophy and every bit of philosophy around him, he seemed to need to think about it and to have something to say about it. That's why he ranges so wide, because he really didn't put down any topic. Everything was open. And I've never met anyone else like him that way. I mean, I've never met a mind that capacious, that wide open, <laughs> that just could philosophical would go in. <laughs> You that something else would come out. It was quite remarkable. I'm curious about his thoughts on Richard Rorty's famous thought experiment about the Antipodians. So I don't know what Putnam's thoughts were. I'm just curious about whether his direct realism is consistent with the Antipodian view. So my understanding of the thought experiment is that you've got, you've got this planet of Antipodians and we go and visit. And when we go and visit the Antipodians and we start asking about them about their experience of the world, they say that they don't have mental states. They don't have beliefs or thoughts or feelings. And when we tell them about our beliefs and thoughts and feelings, they're very confused. Instead, what they have is just neurological states. So they've got state 462. That seems to roughly correlate with what we call pain. And they've got state 961, which roughly correlates with what we call excitement. And in their world, as far as they're concerned, there are no mental states and we're radically wrong about there being mental states. We don't have them. We don't have mental states. All we've got are brain states, neurological states. Now, if we relate this to direct realism, so direct realism is the claim that the world directly affects our mental states or is it our brain states that it affects? And through that direct affectation, it causes content of our thoughts. But the Antipodians would say, we don't have thoughts. But I wondered whether there's a version of direct realism which doesn't refer to thoughts and mental states, just refers to neurological states, which says, well, our neurological states are directly caused by the world, and that's all there is. Putnam isn't just opposed to Cartesianism. He was opposed to what he called Cartesianism cum materialism. So he's opposed to the modern materialist version of Cartesianism, the very view you're now explicating. So he thought that dualism survives perfectly the shift from immaterial mind to material mind. So that's what you were just painting, the thought that you can identify mentality with the central nervous system or the brain. And then you do have the interface conception, you do have a difference between the inside outside that's exactly the view that putnam wanted to overcome i mean that's what he doesn't believe in now when he describes direct realism it's very important that you're not talking about brain states you're talking about perceptual judgments and that you're using the language of every day now he's also famous for and maybe this is part of what your question is getting at He's famous for a view called conceptual pluralism, which is the idea that you can describe the world in many different ways. So I think he would agree that for certain purposes, you can certainly describe someone in terms of their brain states. I think he would reject the thought though, that that's describing their mind. I think he, on that issue, he wasn't prepared to say, that's just an alternative way of talking about the same thing because that would then commit him to this internalism that he doesn't believe in. He would say that there's certain ways of talking about a person where you could say you can talk about them in mental terms or in just physical terms. That's okay. But if you're talking about direct realism as he understood it, you have to use the language of ordinary language of tables, chairs, and so forth, because that's the entry into reference and ordinary concepts from which you then generate more complex concepts and so forth. It's the entering wedge for language, just like Davidson has triangulation and talks about the common object that both you and I are looking at. And he uses ordinary language about that rather than the language of physics. Because if you use the language of physics, you wouldn't know really what you were talking about. <laughs> like you wouldn't know that you were talking about an apple or whatever it was. It wouldn't be salient under that description. 
So I'm not sure what he would do with that thought experiment that you gave, because I mean, I take it, he would think they do have mentality because they're interpretable by us as having beliefs and desires, even though they don't describe themselves in those terms. So it, it's a curious case, but for himself, he certainly would have opposed that thinking and wouldn't be happy with the thought that, that what you're describing is mine, because that just seems to beg a lot of questions for him. So you might ask the question, well, what did he think mind was? And I think he ended up saying something like it's a set of world involving capacities, or it's sort of like this doing an idea that the mind and world are implicating each other, that the world mind doesn't stop at the, at the brain body interface or whatever, or the mind doesn't stop at the barrier of the body or something like that, that in a sense, you can't locate the mind. <laughs> The idea that you can locate the mind inside, I think he rejected that completely. And again, I think his thinking about externalism makes the whole issue of locating mind or putting it inside just metaphorical. It, it, it can't be made sense of.